Hello, everyone. After a long delay, or what seems like a long delay to me, since talking to you last, this is Bill Samuel at Woodsong. And I come at the holiday season to bring you greetings and to tell you hello. You know, I often wonder by what right, by what right dare I make these tapes and send them into the homes of others to be listened to. I guess I do it by the same right that one writes a letter to say hello and to say I love you and to say everything is all right. I do it by the by the same right that one sometimes phones a loved one because the urge comes to do it. And I guess that's why I do it. The sound you hear is rain on the roof of Woodsong. It's been a while since we've had rain and this is very welcome. It's been so warm here, so very warm. Here it is almost Christmas and still, still no cold weather. But it has been the most beautiful fall I think Alabama has ever had. Never have the yellows been so yellow and the reds so red. Never, never have the trees spoken with so much so much verve and enthusiasm as they have this fall. Well, the delay has been because of the same old problem. Problem, I call it. The same attempt to write and to write what I have finally decided can't really be written. It's really sort of a simple thing I want to do to state a complete and self-supporting philosophy of truth that I've lived for myself and know to be the truth and to do it in a reasonably short book. <laughs> you know, I know it can be done. Lao Tzu presented the basis for, for his idea, Taoism. He did it in so few words that they can be read in just a few moments. Oh, it may take a lifetime to fully comprehend those few words, but they nonetheless contain all, all that is necessary to understand, else the great schools of Taoism wouldn't exist. And I look at all these mountains of papers I've written over the years, and I just wonder how, how can they be compressed into a few pages, just a few, that express the original idea. Well, whether it ever gets done or not really doesn't make much difference. It's the effort that matters. And I'm making the effort. The, uh, the experience, spelled with a capital E, the experience that has evolved for me and one that I'm certain is not original with me, even though it is perhaps the original experience for all of us, strangely doesn't come with an energy or with a vocabulary to tell of it. The truth that has presented itself here has absolutely no consideration whatever of proselyting, of growing, of organizing, of kingdom building, of trying to convince others of its rightness as opposed to somebody else's idea. 
This joy, I don't know what to call it, the joy of understanding, maybe, it seems more like uh, one's belated discovery of, of the light, the morning light, after wandering around in abject darkness. And then, after the light is discovered, who in the world wants to sit down in some dim room somewhere to write of that discovery? Who can break away from the morning splendor long enough to, to tell of it like that? There's another thing. It's, you know how a hush comes over an audience this this is the curtain rises. Well, exactly so, a hush descends on the heart of us when we look at the wonders of simple I amness, of simple being. that would, as, as far as time go, be something that we've only recently found. And, and when, when that happens, we're hardly disposed to go searching through the world of words to try to tell of it. Well, and there is, of course, that grand, exuberant song we sing when we find some measure of truth. We sing it because we can't help it, like a mockingbird singing on top of a pine tree, just singing. Uh, that exuberant song that is aimless and has no motive, uh, that is done automatically. That uh, capacity to do that comes to all of us with the discovery of truth. And it doesn't mean that we do it with words. It might well be that we do it. We do it with a smile. We do it with how we walk. We do it with, with a new view of the universe. We do it with, with holding a child's hand. or We do it with uh, washing the dishes or taking care of a family. Or we might do it in a poem or in a, in a song. But, I guess in simpler words, I, like Lao Tzu, all of us would prefer to just, once the truth is discerned and seen for the beauty and the wonder it is, we would prefer to lean against the fence post and enjoy the meandering rivers spread before us than to, than to look away from it and to try to record it in the pages of a journal or to paint it on a canvas. Therefore, it seems to me, and, and I want to be careful how I say this, so please listen gently, that most of the books which purport to tell others how to arrive at the truth were not written out of this great a special sacrifice of song singing like the mockingbird, but were for the very largest part written to establish an ego or to create and build a following or to establish a, a personal kingdom for oneself and, or to make money in the world. There are those who, who see something grand and then like the lark, a wing or the poet filled with joy, simply sing it and write it and shout of it and tell the world of it. Now, now, I don't mean that those statements are the ones that are full of aim and motive. What I mean is that those statements are very seldom found because they are so seldom published. They're not popular. They're not commercial. They're not commercial because they aren't pop pop popular. <laughs> and and that's why they're not published. Even though, even though the song they sing just may be the elixir the entire world seeks and seems, at least seems in these days, to need so desperately. 
there is no aim nor motive here at Woodsong. And those who come here know that. These communications are just songs of joy. Like, like the mockingbird song thrown out on the wind. They are a statement of all rightness, of God's all readiness. They are a statement of guiltlessness, a statement that everything is all right the statement that God is here right now and that God, Spirit, is all and that there is nothing contrary, nothing opposing, nothing arguing. Yes, that everything is all right. Now, the message that comes to us like this, that says, I love you, that says, you're not guilty, that says, you've never made a mistake, that says, God is all in all right here, right now, this very moment, isn't a very scientific statement. It isn't a very intellectual statement because there's very little human reason and logic behind it. And yet, you know, right right now, I look outside Woodsong's window and I see a little baby squirrel out there nosing around. He's burying nuts and he's preparing for the holiday season just like Rachel and, and I am. Now, that little squirrel has never lived a winter He's never lived the deprivation of, of cold and snow and ice. But he's out there scurrying around with all the rest of the squirrels and he's burying nuts. Intellectually, what he's doing makes no sense. His reason and logic says, why, this is insane. It's some sort of a strange, something deep within, like a river within. And I'm doing it. Well, the squirrel is doing out of his knowing and knowing out of his doing. And nowhere, nowhere in all of that knowing and doing is there a book involved or a lot of words involved. There was an old Alabama black man who was stretched forth his hand and he touched the face of a living, growing flower. And in that simplicity and humility that was his way, he, he said after that experience, or he wrote after that experience, when I touch that flower, I am touching infinity. It existed long before there were human beings on this earth and will continue to exist for the millions of years to come. Through the flower, I talk to the infinite, which is a silent force. Now, this is, a, is not a physical contact. It is not in the earthquake, the wind, or the fire. It's in the invisible world. It's in that still, small voice that calls up the fairies. The man who said that was George Washington Carver. He named his laboratory down here in Alabama. He called it God's Little Garden. And in that laboratory where so many wonders were performed, George Washington Carver never allowed a student to bring a book into it. And he never took a book into it himself.
Well, from what you heard on the other side of this tape, one might conclude that I'm disparaging the worth of books. Well, I haven't meant to do that at all. I believe that we all awaken one day to discover that while words <laughs> and books are meaningful and important to us and have a rightful place in our affairs, the words which are most important are the ones we live by, the ones that proceed from our very own lips and not, not the words of others. Well, from what you heard on the other side of this tape, one might conclude that I'm disparaging the worth of books. Well, I haven't meant to do that at all. I believe that we all awaken one day to discover that while words <laughs> and books are meaningful and important to us and have a rightful place in our affairs, the words which are most important are the ones we live by, the ones that proceed from our very own lips and not, not the words of others. Well, here it is, Christmas again, almost. Walt Whitman called it the sweet season. But all time is Christmas time. The temporal day, what really, what does Christmas stand for? What does it mean? It, it marks the, that time in our affairs when the Christ light was consciously awakened to. Christmas, the temporal day itself, merely marks the Christ light awakened to and recognized. Not an historic Christ indwelling a finite body, but the light of Christ, the truth of identity. Christmas marks our recognition of this fact. It's our own day. It's our own holy day. It's our own whole day. It's our own holiday supreme. Indwelling light, being all. Light of all. Light of each. Light of everyone and everything. The day itself, that December day, is no more unique than any other day. Every moment is truth's moment. And you know, every season marks a Christ in some special way. Take this moment, for instance. Outside, I see a yellow leaf falling softly, silently. It's a little tree's gift to the earth. Spirit's reciprocity. Ah, but now, this is not to deny that there's a very special happiness about the holiday season. <laughs> it, it seems a time when a greater portion of our tangible selfhood begins to think of others. It's a time when we subdue that old fictitious Ebenezer for a spell. It's a time when we take time to put twinkles on the branches of, of green cedars and, and into the eyes of little tiny Tims. This is the time that we acknowledge and admit and respond to the twinkle in the gentle eyes of agelessness. This, of all seasons, can be a time when our lonely ones can be shown that lonely means only and that alone means all one. Jesus, Jesus spoke of the kingdom of heaven as a 
movement and a rest. Well, yes, this is the season for coming home. This is the season of the prodigal's return wherein he finds that he has never really been away. This is the time when family and friends gather around the hearth. Somehow heart and hearth go together, don't they? Just like Laughter and tears go together. The same way warm embraces and runny red noses <laughs> are a part of the holiday scene. And while this is a time for that, it is always a time for that. Because when is a twinkle? When is a twinkle out of season? When are the tears of happiness out of stock? And when is love, love light, not the living teacher on the scene? And what, what is the passing of years but the child lived longer? So, <laughs> this season, while the trees rest and friends and families come together again, we take special note of the peace on earth that this now moment is. This holy now. This whole now. We know that the tassels and tinsel and plum pudding and red noses are all for us. They're for us. When we walk through the decorated department stores, all of those decorations are for us. When we see the Christmas fineries all over the world, it's for us, for our own recognition and awakening to the Christ child within. Spirit is the spirit of Christmas. And spirit is the I of us. All, all the disputes and desolation in the world are peace made plain upon the table. We live them and call them by their right name. We know that the need for warfare's delineation is ended. We live the Christ light of love we are. And in so doing, the millennium, the fabled millennium, continues. And among still other things, Christmas is a twinkling tree and a catch in the voice. <laughs> Christmas is an unexpected gift given or received. Christmas is an old friend's smile and a new friend's laughter. Christmas is a deep breath and a sigh. Two puffs of feathers huddled on a snowy branch. And sometimes, sometimes, two hearts in tune, two hearts beating as one, two children drifting aimlessly on an uncharted river together, together. And speaking of drifting on the river, many of you will remember the days I lived aboard Lollygog. For ten years, the notes from Lollygog were written aboard a little houseboat on the Coosa River Oh, lolly God. Now, the affairs of Rachel and me are such that it would seem very wise to go back down to the primal river of life 
and there spend time again on the river. So now, another little houseboat is coming to our affairs. Her name is Aimless. <laughs> Sweet Aimless. That has neither motive nor aim nor destination. Sweet Aimless. And as, as the days go on and as time passes, you'll hear from us, from Aimless, We'll let you hear the sounds of the of the early morning on the river. We'll let you hear the wind through the trees along the banks. We'll let you hear the bullfrogs and the crickets and maybe the fish jumping. Maybe even the night cry of the loons. That's a promise. But Rachel and I We'll be going back down to the Coosa River for a time. For a time. About rivers, Emerson wrote these lovely words. The river knows the way to the sea. Without a pilot, it runs and falls, blessing all sands with its charity. And Robert Louis Stevenson, in a little poem, infinitely more complex than its simple word sound, writes, Dark brown is the river, golden is the sand. It flows on forever with trees on either hand, green leaves of floating, castles on the foam, Boats of mine are floating. When will all come home? On goes the river and out past the mill. Away down the valley, away down the hill, away down the river, a hundred miles or more. Other little children shall bring my boats ashore. And, of course, you might guess that Thoreau would mention rivers. I conclude this short tape to you with these words from Thoreau. And oh, how I mean them. As I love nature, as I love singing birds and gleaming stubble and flowing rivers and morning and evening <laughs> and summer, in winter, I love thee, my friend. I love thee.